Hello YouTubers, my name is Frederick Lopez. It's been a while since I've done a movie review, but for this week we have the release of Star Wars Rogue One, which is a prequel to the original trilogy, but a sequel to the prequel trilogy. So, in honor of the release of Star Wars Rogue One, I decided to visit the prequel trilogy. Yes, the Star Wars prequel trilogy. And today in this episode of Movie Review, I'm going to go over the infamous Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Now, before we continue, uh, this film does have its flaws. However, even though it may not be the best Star Wars film, and probably the weakest in the saga, I would have to say that does not mean it is a bad film, by any means. Uh, if you judge it by itself, without comparing it to the original trilogy, uh, this film is entertaining, and uh, it does have its pros and cons like any film. But uh, I, however, like the film, uh, so you're not going to hear too much of a rant in this review. It's going to be more of a review, kind of retrospective. Uh, but yeah, uh, to start off things, I'm just going to give a prologue. Uh, it was released in 1999, and we didn't have Star Wars for the longest time. Star Wars ended when Return of the Jedi uh, was released in 1983. And you had, like, the Ewok Adventure films on VHS, some video games on the Super Nintendo here and there. And then, around the mid-90s, and I was a kid during this time, so I caught Star Wars uh, sort of in a resurgence uh, in the mid-90s. They re-released the original trilogy, and then uh, in 1997, George Lucas decided to remaster the films and release special edition versions with extra effects and everything so it would be up to date to the prequels coming out. And on the VHS tapes he was talking about the prequels and uh, the first episode. Of course they got their episode names as a homage to the Flash Gordon serials. Uh, but uh, he had the script, basically the core of it, written when he wrote Star Wars back in 1975 and 6. He had it in his yellow journal. Uh, so, the hype to this was unreal. I mean, you kind of saw a little bit of it in Force Awakens, but not like this. This was like, oh my god, Star Wars is returning, and we get to see Anakin before his Darth Vader get all our answers, you young Obi-Wan, and George Lucas is coming back to direct. And George Lucas, uh, this was his first film since the original Star Wars in about 22, 23 years. So, like, yeah, he hasn't really made that many films besides the prequels, original Star Wars, American Graffiti, and THX 1138. It must have been smaller stuff, but uh, it was a big, big deal when it first came out. I mean, a huge deal. Merchandise everywhere. Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and KFC uh, joined forces to have merchandise. Darth Maul cups, Pepsi, like, Star Wars was everywhere. It was pretty much like the film Fanboys. I mean, in the meantime, by Space Hog playing, and Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. Star Wars was 1999. Such a big deal. Um, but anyway, uh, the film was released, and uh, it got kind of mixed reviews, and then later on was really kind of bashed upon. A lot of people who grew up with the original trilogy didn't like it. You have some kids who say it's the best and don't like the originals, and I'm kind of in the middle. I love all Star Wars. Nothing could beat the original trilogy. The original Star Wars trilogy is probably one of the best trilogies of all time in cinema. But Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith are entertaining films. This film does have its flaws, but there's one thing I must say that it does do right, and that is it is original. I mean, this film has probably the most original stuff in it compared to the other prequels, compared to the other Star Wars films, and just compared to other films in general. Uh, so in that regard, uh, it's not a failure. I remember I saw this, it was sold out, so I saw it on the fourth day with my parents, and it was crazy. People camped out, before online tickets, people camped out around the theater. I saw a guy dressed as Darth Maul and Darth Vader fighting each other with a toy lightsaber used to come out. That was pretty much like a flashlight screwed on with like a filter and like a plastic, uh, saber. So, it was crazy. Uh, first Star Wars I saw in cinemas, uh, I missed out on the special editions in theaters and the re-release of the originals, so I uh, just saw this one uh, along with the others. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm actually a fan of this film, and despite its flaws, it does have one of the best freaking lightsaber fights, and I'll get more to that later. But anyway... Uh, here's the cast, director, synopsis, and then I'm going to go into my thoughts and review. So here we go. 
Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace stars Liam Neeson as Qui-Gon Jinn, Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi, Natalie Portman as Queen Amidala slash Padme, Jake Lloyd as Anakin Skywalker, Ian McDermott as Senator Palpatine, Pranilla August as Shmi Skywalker, Hugh Corsi as Captain Panaka, Ahmed Best as Jar Jar Binks, Anthony Daniels as C-3PO, Kenny Baker as R2-D2, Frank Oz as Yoda, Terrence Stamp as Chancellor Valorum, with an appearance of Samuel L. Jackson as Mace Windu. George Lucas wrote and directed the film. So what is Episode 1 The Phantom Menace all about? It starts when the Trade Federation organizes a blockade around the planet of Naboo. The Supreme Chancellor Valorum sends two Jedi, Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi, to negotiate the end of the blockade. However, the evil Viceroy, Newt Gunray, is ordered to kill the Jedi and invade Naboo. The Jedi escape, and Qui-Gon saves the life of the clumsy Gungan named Jar Jar Binks. This outcast native takes the Jedi to his submerged city, and the Gungan leader gives them transportation to the surface. The Jedi head to the capital to warn Queen Amidala about this invasion. She's been captured by the Federation droids, and the Jedi must rescue her. They flee Naboo in a spacecraft, but then, during a battle, the ship becomes damaged, and they must land on this desert planet named Tatooine. Qui-Gon Jar Jar and R2-D2, along with the Queen's assistant, Padme, search for the necessary part to repair the ship. When they find the component, they don't have enough money to buy it, and must make a deal with a slave owner. During this, the slave owner has a helper named Anakin Skywalker who offers to dispute a race with his pod to raise necessary money. Qui-Gon Jinn notices that Anakin Skywalker is strong with the Force. They then enlist his help in fighting the war, while the Jedi confront one of the Dark Jedi behind the invasion, Darth Maul, while his master Darth Sidious continues to lead the invasion as a phantom menace behind the scenes. To make a long story short, that's kind of it. Uh, not the best synopsis plot summary, but uh, that's pretty much what the film is about. Uh, this invasion starts, they rescue the Queen, the ship gets damaged, they're on the planet of Tatooine, and here is where they meet Anakin Skywalker. And for those familiar with the original trilogy, first of all, if you haven't seen Star Wars, where the hell have you been? And get off your ass, turn this off, and go see it. Like, seriously. But anyways, for those familiar with Star Wars or may not be familiar, Anakin Skywalker becomes the villain Darth Vader later on in the original trilogy. And this is before all that. This is how the Star Wars begin. Uh, of course, there's a long history with the Old Republic and the Sith and the Jedi. But uh, anyway, their ship gets damaged. They meet Anakin Skywalker. He offers to be in a pod race to raise enough money. And Qui-Gon senses that this boy is really, really attuned with the Force. And uh, pretty much after they win the money, he uh, convinces Watto to sell him, so he's now free, but he must leave behind his mother and go with him to be a Jedi. And during this, they must fight Darth Maul, who is basically a dark apprentice. He's a Sith Lord. That's the apprentice of Darth Sidious, who later on you find out ends up being Emperor Palpatine from the original trilogy, but it's pretty much the Phantom Menace uh, orchestrating things behind the scenes to start this war and disrupt the Republic. And uh, the whole movie is pretty much them basically rescuing Naboo from the grips of this trade federation. And uh, that's pretty much a summary. And uh, yeah, it's very different than the other Star Wars films. Uh, but technology has progressed. Uh, the effects are amazing. Uh, but it is really, really, really computerized compared to the previous films. And something about computerized effects do not stand up as well as models and practicality. Uh, with practical effects, and uh, you could tell it was computerized when it first came out, but it's one of those films that has not really aged very well. There's some stuff that still looks good, like Watto. Watto looks good, Jabba the Hutt, the pod racing scenes, some of the ships, and uh, everything else, though, kind of has that, like, 90s video game vibe, almost like the first Toy Story. When you look at, like, the first Toy Story compared to number three, it just has that kind of computerized, like, rendering type of like 90s uh, Macintosh computer vibe and it has not aged well but uh, yeah it's a very different type of film it's a lot more action-packed uh, there's been some criticisms of it being boring which it, it is kind of in some parts but it's a very different film there's a lot of stuff with politics in the Senate and I like George Lucas's approach with this because the other ones, he showed us Star Wars and ships fighting, but this one is more about, like, 
how do how does a war like the one in Star Wars get started in the first place? So there's a lot to be explored there. And again, like I said, it is a very original film. There is effects in worlds we have never seen in any of this. We haven't even seen in any other Star Wars film or any other film. The Gungans on uh, Naboo is just beautiful. Uh, all that type of stuff. The ships. Even They even thought of another way to kind of have a semi-Death Star without having a Death Star with the Trib Federation ship. And the pod race scene is spectacular. Uh, Ahmed Best uh, did a good job as Jar Jar, I thought. Like, when you listen to the actor, he did sound very different compared to Jar Jar. And uh, he does get really, really annoying sometimes. He's actually super annoying. So annoying that you just wish Chewbacca would get over to him and rip his arms out of his socket. But, you know, that's not the actor's fault. That's the writing and, and George Lucas there. And uh, I think the actor did a great job. And you get to see him in the bar scene in Attack of the Clones and as a Jedi in this film. And, uh, yeah, it's just too much Jar Jar, and, uh, it gets silly at points. It's not as serious as the original trilogy, but on its own, it's really good, and, and George Lucas really went with a different approach here. Uh, the ships are really crisp and clean. Naboo has kind of a sleek vibe to it, and not only does that represent Naboo, but I think the reason why is because it's before the Star Wars occurred. So this is the galaxy before the wars occurred, so it doesn't have that grit and kind of realism that the original trilogy had, and there's a good reason for that. But I think without that realism, it kind of takes you out of it a bit. You don't get as invested in this. And also, there's just a lot of characters. There's not a main focus. I mean, they have Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. Everybody does a good job in this film, but you don't have that hero's journey. Uh, I think Force Awakens, even though it was a retread of A New Hope, did have multiple plot points and characters while also showing us a hero called Rey. Kind of like Luke in the original trilogy with the hero's journey of this person in this place and then being introduced to this world with the audience. You didn't really have that here. You just had a lot of characters, but you didn't really have a main central focus to be introduced. And uh, Anakin could be the main character and so could Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. It's just that Anakin's introduced later in the film, so you're not introduced to him right away. It'd be one thing to like introduce him at the beginning of the film and then just have like multiple story threads that end up meeting, but it doesn't have that, so I think that's why it just feels a little bit different. Uh, but Liam Neeson is excellent as Qui-Gon Jinn. Uh, he brings gravitas to the role and to this film. Hugh McGregor does a great job as young Obi-Wan Kenobi. I mean, he studied, in the trivia, he studied Alec Guinness's, like, mannerisms and movement and his speech patterns so he would be able to speak like Alec Guinness. And say what you will about the prequel trilogy, about this film, Hugh McGregor is, like, the best part of it. And Natalie Portman was in this film. She was only 16. Uh, she's, she does good with what she has. She's pretty much the character she's supposed to be. Queen Amidala slash Padme. But I do love that whole part where she's pretending to be her handmaid and there's a decoy. So you get to see more versatility in her acting there. Nice scene, Jabba the Hutt. Uh, and then Tatooine. And then Darth Maul. Ray Park as Darth Maul. He was a stunt double. You may recognize him in some scenes of Mortal Kombat Annihilation as Raiden. Uh, he was Toad in X-Men. But uh, he is great as Darth Maul, but he doesn't have very much to say. It's a very, uh, uh, not very much dialogue to go on with that character. But the fights, holy shit. Say what you will, pros and cons. The pros, that lightsaber fight is probably the best lightsaber fight in the whole saga. Probably up there with uh, Luke and Darth Vader and Anakin and Obi-Wan. Like, that fight with Darth Maul, Qui-Gon Jinn, and... Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan is just fantastic. Like, it is freaking awesome. Duel of the Fates with John Williams. Okay, the visuals as far as like the action, lightsaber fights, and the soundtrack make this movie. Along with a pod racing scene. And that was also a good game. Yeah, good, good game. Episode 1 game was hard. But, uh, yeah. Uh, the visuals are great. Uh, George Lucas, though, as far as the acting, I just wish he maybe had more of a director-actor relationship. Sometimes things seem a little wooden or just kind of flat. But it's not bad by any means as far as, like, cringeworthy. I've seen worse, but it's just that you, there needs to be a little more emotion and more investment. And a lot of that has to just do with the writing. Uh, but also, it's kind of hard to judge it to other films because this is a children's film. This is more of a children's Star Wars film. So if you look at it through that way... It does work. And Jar Jar, yes, he's annoying, but he's kind of supposed to be annoying. 
and that works. He's pretty much kind of like the 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 jokester. He's pretty much the the klutz. He's just the the fool, really. He just gets into everything and meddles into things and mess it up, messes things up. He's supposed to be that character that fits his trope. And uh, I like a lot of the cultural influences in this. Anne McDermott as uh, Senator Palpatine is pretty cool. Of course, all of you may know he's Emperor Palpatine, and it's nice seeing him in this role before he's revealed to be the Sith Lord. And uh, I also like how he acts with the cloak on. Yoda. Frank Oz's Yoda does a great job. I like the puppet. Now, the version now is computerized, so they've fixed that, and there's like a special edition thing with the Blu-ray release to make it look like Attack of the Clones or Revenge of the Sith. But then there's this other puppet, which I actually kind of like the puppet. I like Yoda as a puppet. It makes him seem more lifelike. Uh, he didn't look like the one from the Empire Strikes Back, but you know what? It's also a younger Yoda. Obi-Wan doesn't look like Obi-Wan from A New Hope, so why should Yoda? So it didn't really bother me, but uh, I like both versions. The computerized version makes it more consistent with the next two films, but there's something to be had with a puppet and the performance and making it look lifelike. Samuel Jackson's great in his small role as Mace Windu, a role that's small in this film but gets expanded through the next two installments. And uh, George Lucas, uh, in this one, it was very computerized, but he did some stuff like the original films, like on-set locations, and the way it feels, it feels more like the older Star Wars, but before it got totally digital. And originally he asked Steven Spielberg, Ron Howard, and Robert Zemeckis to direct a film, but uh, he ended up directing it himself and writing it. Uh, he asked uh, Lawrence Kasdan to come back, and Lawrence Kasdan's like, you know what? You kind of took a backseat in Empire and Return of the Jedi. Uh, tell your story. And he did. Uh, it was his story. And uh, I feel like this film gets an unfair shake, but it's not the best film. It does have cons, and the, like the ones I just mentioned. Uh, but it's not a bad film. Uh, it's action-packed from beginning to end. You have the whole beginning with the ship. Uh, the pod race scene is just spectacular. I've never seen anything like it before. And other films, and that was such a great scene. Uh, uh, there are some deleted scenes that would have added a lot more of like why Anakin and Qui Gon were running when Darth Maul was uh, searching. Just different things that really would have added to the film. But ultimately, I think what suffers in this film is the writing and then overuse of Jar Jar Binks. Jar Jar Binks is in this way too much. And it's, it's supposed to be that character, like I said, but there has to be a point where enough is enough. He just like. It starts to be like every scene he's in, he's really affecting it. But uh, other than that, uh, it's a solid film. It's not the strongest Star Wars film, but for a prequel, for a start of a new trilogy that's kind of on its own, it's good. And everything that happens in it, it doesn't undermine the original trilogy. Sure, there may be some nostalgia that affects the original trilogy and how you personally feel towards it, but there's nothing in this film that really affects the original trilogy, so they're both their kind of own thing. And this film is a solid start. Uh, you get to see the beginnings of Obi-Wan and Anakin. And I think that's what George Lucas wanted, to see a parallel of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin at this point in their lives. Uh, but I just wish they made Padme and Anakin at least look a little bit closer in age. They are in the story. It's just that she looks like, it looks like a little kid's fall in love with her. And then he's just like, are you an angel? Which is cute and all, but... Some of that just feels awkward, again, with, like, the cast and directing and writing. But uh, as far as, like, technology, I mean, George Lucas has really improved, and of course he has a budget and everything, but from Star Wars, the technology has progressed. And I have to say, that's one thing I respect about him, his originality, and just being a pioneer of all these effects uh, before they basically went full steam in the movies you see now. And the lightsabers, before they couldn't show the lightsabers turn on and off, and in this one, you get to see it in camera, Choreography is great. They did a lot of stunt work, uh, a lot of blue screen, and then uh, when Qui Gon dies, you just feel it, and uh, that that whole the last part is just fantastic. Um, but it's really more the beginning of things, and uh, I think it gets an unfair shake. It's not that bad of a film, and again, it does have its cons. So if I had to give Phantom Menace a score, I would probably give it a three out of five. And then, uh, as far as numbers and letter grade, I would probably have to give it a 6 out of 10, and then uh, B minus, C plus, but more B minus. Duel of the Fates and that lightsaber fight and the pod race really bring it up a notch, and plus Liam Neeson is Qui-Gon Jinn. So I would give it a B minus, a 6 out of 10, and a 3 out of 5. Uh, it's probably the weakest out of the entire Star Wars saga, out of the 6, and definitely of the 3. But by itself, it's a very entertaining film, and it's nowhere near as bad as what critics and most often fanboys say about it. 
And it's very mixed on critics, but like, there's a lot of fanboys who love the originals, and the originals are great. Don't get me wrong, the originals are fantastic. But this is different, and I think it should be deserved to be judged on its own. You can't just compare it to the originals. You have to look at it as its own. And unlike Force Awakens, uh, I have to say, at least this is original and doesn't retread anything. Even though there is some similarities with like Qui-Gon Dine and Obi-Wan and The New Hope, it does its own thing. And you get some good performances. Oh yeah, I forgot, Captain Panaka is a different actor in this, but Captain Panaka, for those who may think it may look familiar, uh, if you've seen Highlander, yes, he's that guy in Highlander, so how cool is that? Um, <laughs> And Terrence Stamp, General Zod's Chancellor Valorum. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, if you ever play any games out there, play Pod Race and then Jedi Power Battles. Mace Windu had a blue lightsaber in this. Then there's like a chick Yoda that was like named Yaddle. So that's interesting. E.T. showed in this film. And there's a lot of merchandising and hype, and I think it was ultimately a letdown and kind of disappointing after all that hype built up. But if you look at it in retrospect now and just on its own, again, it's an entertaining film. And the start of the prequel trilogy. And maybe the reasons why we refer to them as the prequels. So, uh, I could go into this more, but that's just my quick thoughts about Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Yes, I still have the toys. I was dressed as Obi-Wan. Like, this, I like this movie. I don't like it anywhere near A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, or Return of the Jedi, but I like it for what it is. And the lightsaber fight's awesome. And you also get to see, uh more origins of how the war got started. Uh, the Force, besides being a surrounding things, you get to hear about metachlorians. That gets criticized a lot, but at least they explain exactly what it is that makes up the Force. Not just things around, but just metachlorians and more of a scientific reason. There's kind of, mes of a messiah quality to Anakin Skywalker uh, being born without a father. So that's kind of cool, almost like the Force wanted it to happen. Then you have the prophecy, which isn't bad because we haven't heard about it, but then that kind of adds another element of like, really? There's a prophecy that's been kind of used a lot. But uh, it works for this film. And uh, yeah, that's my quick thoughts. And uh, yeah, tune in for the next movie review in which I will go over how sand feels like in Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. After that will be my review of Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. And then... For the big one this weekend, Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Anyway, that's how I feel about Star Wars Phantom Menace. Not the best film, but it is entertaining for what it is. And I've seen a lot more worse films since. And it's original, so what can I say? You can't really find that too much these days, so that's that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this movie review. Uh, feel free to comment. What are your thoughts on Phantom Menace? Uh, did you absolutely hate it? Do you think it's like the bane of your existence? Is it the worst thing ever? Is it a fan of Menace? Uh, did you like it? Uh, what's your favorite Star Wars film? Whether in the prequels, original? Uh, just give me your thoughts out there. What was your favorite moments? Uh, character, lightsaber fights, just anything. And uh, yeah, what was your favorite Star Wars video game? Just, just any question and your thoughts on fan of Menace. And it's okay if you hate it, I understand. But I don't think it's as bad as what people say. So, on that note, again, I hope you enjoyed this review, and uh, stay tuned for my review of Attack of the Clones.